This episode of Going In Raw is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you ever felt like your brain was getting in its own way? I did when I started dealing with severe anxiety in my mid-20s, and I turned to therapy so I could figure out what was holding me back and get my brain to work for me rather than against me. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's completely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. All you got to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash raw today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash raw. Hey, friend, no Steve here. Mel Larson. Welcome to Going In Raw Count. And on this episode, look, man, last week we talked about the creative botches of the WWE. Oh, this is this is where this is where Steve especially solidifies his e drone bona fides. Here. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know me. Uh, you can't spell Steve without two e's because I'm an e drone. Yeah. And uh, and I'm looking forward to this one. I've been salivating at the mouth frothing if you will ready to just rip a new one into all elite wrestling Ooh, ooh. <laughs> but hey you know we're not playing favorites here we did this for wb last week we're doing it for AEW right. this week Heck, maybe if if we we're so inclined maybe we'll do an episode on impact wrestling as well whoa you know i'll be honest with you the research on that would be wildly fun i would really actually would I, I think that would actually turn us into bigger tna fans i think it would uh, as well than not I think it would yeah. as well so uh we'll see we'll see how that goes but uh anyways yeah look man fair is fair last week we looked at the man honestly like we i feel like even last week we scratched the surface oh, wwe's yeah. been around for you know over six decades or whatever it is at this point um so yeah, I feel like we only scratched the surface. That hell, we we left off the five year reign of Bob Backlund. That could have been one I of the know. biggest creative botches of WWE. That guy was boring as shit. He really but, was. Right here, to talk about WWE. We're here to talk about a company that's been here for uh, only about four years, as opposed to six decades plus. AEW. You know, a lot of criticisms levied at AEW these days uh, for uh, for its inconsistent creative. My opinion, probably the reason why we see low attendance numbers uh, and uh, and maybe viewer cool off. This past week's episode of Dynamite, kind of, kind of a gnarly number there. Wasn't great. Less than NXT. Yeah. Less than NXT. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, yeah, you know, maybe sometimes looking at the past and its fumbles, assuming, and I assume that he does, Tony Khan watches this show. Uh, maybe it'll give him some ideas as to how he can improve his product to make it more entertaining. Entertaining. You know, here's the thing. Especially when you're doing creative stuff. And I understand Tony Khan works upwards of 80 hours, 80 hours a week, but he doesn't have time for self-reflection. Oh, I, could be, I don't yeah. know. There's only so many hours in a day, and apparently he works all of them. Yeah, um, right, yeah. So, you know, hey, I'll say it's hey. the camera, assuming TK is watching. Can I yeah, call you ahead. TK? Yeah, please do. If you're watching this episode... You can take what we say with a great assault if you want. All we ask. In the camera. In the camera. Sorry. Just take a moment to ponder and think about these creative fumbles, these botches. You do not like talking in the camera, do you? <laughs> I don't. I don't like making eye contact. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, hey, just take a moment. Take 30 seconds out of your day. I know you're a busy man. You work 2,000 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Just take a moment to think, what can we do better ask right, yourself yeah. that question yeah what exactly can, keep these keep these fumbles in mind to think to yourself right what can we do better how can we improve so that we can start beating those other guys anyways let's go ahead and talk about this. nxt they're not beating main roster that would be anytime soon no yeah, probably never. not but you know what it's good to dream let's go ahead and start with number 10 10 Everybody loves the acclaimed, and then they had them drop the tag titles. That's number ten. The acclaimed dropped the tag titles to the guns, Larson. Yeah, this happened at a, 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 a Dynamite Championship Fight Night, yeah, February eighth, twenty twenty three, from El Paso, Texas. Uh, just one hundred and forty days prior, the acclaimed beat Swerve in Our Glory. More on Keith Lee and Swerve later uh, at Dynamite Grand Slam twenty twenty two. 
So at the p- point where the Acclaim won the tag titles at Dynamite Grand Slam last year, you could very well make the case that the Acclaim were the most popular act in all of AEW. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they were wildly popular. People Wildly loved. popular. And their popularity did not diminish whatsoever after they won those tag titles. If anything, they were even more popular. It yeah. seemed like a third of the crowd was wearing uh, Acclaim shirts. There's all sorts of giant scissors in the crowd and signs saying, Scissor me, daddy ass. They were wildly popular. To his credit also, Tony Khan had maybe seen the match that Swerve and Our Glory had won against the Acclaim at the pay-per-view prior to that one. Yes. And yes. Uh, where the Acclaimed, which and, and it, it was it was absolutely crazy to see Swerve and Our Glory, a very popular team, and Keith Lee specifically, a very popular wrestler with the, with the crowd, start to turn on Keith Lee and start to turn on that team in favor of the Acclaimed Many of us were wondering, I wonder if there was any consideration towards calling an audible and having the Acclaimed win that match. They went ahead and did another match. The Acclaimed won. Huge pop. Wildly popular. They had nailed this homegrown team, which had which had, which had had been an AEW creation. Mm-hmm. They had gotten it absolutely perfect. And then you start to hear rumbles that, oh, FTR might be on their way back to take the titles off the guns. Wait a second. The acclaimed are the tag champions, and sure enough, the guns. And I watched this again, and I'm sure you probably did too. No reaction. The guns. Oh, the won. air goes out of the arena completely. The big overbooked finish involving multiple title shots, you know, to the to the head, and uh, and and the 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 guns ended up winning. I think it was Austin who got like a roll up after a title shot from uh, from Colton uh, on Bowens uh, got the roll up win, and uh, and yeah, it just. <laughs> you yeah. could hear the air get sucked out of the building. Yep, a thousand percent, a thousand percent. I remember that vividly from watching it that night. Um, and then it took a while for the acclaim to kind of find their feet creatively again. It was yeah. it was seemingly a situation where all, well, we lost the tag titles. Should we go after those again? No. Instead, we're going to focus on the trios titles because we want daddy ass to have a championship one more time before he retires. Mm-hmm. And that was their story. And it kind of felt like, yeah, the acclaim, I know, I know Billy Gunn's a part of what they do, mm-hmm. yeah, but what the reason he claimed over is, is as over as what they are is because Caster and Bowens are great yeah, and right. they got tons of charisma. They put on fun matches mm-hmm. and they're wildly creative in terms of how they interact with the crowd. Mm-hmm. And they're really yeah. good with it. That's what really got them over. Yeah. Rather than focusing on that. And AEW has a consistent, from the very beginning, problem with maintaining momentum. Yeah. The acclaimed had all the momentum winning those titles. True. And then for whatever reason, I guess because they want to have FTR versus the guns when FTR came back, they they had the, the acclaimed drop the tag titles. Yeah. Regardless. They claim they're like, all right, we're gonna be we're gonna be trios champions now. That means we have to beat House of Black. Then you have Billy Gunn doing this crisis of confidence thing, and they have to get him back so they can beat House of Black. They're the trios champs. They're seemingly more focused on helping out MJF than actually defending the trios titles. Um, and and it, I don't know. It felt like the focus was moved off of what got them over in the first place to tell a story involving Billy Gunn, who's sixty years old. Follow through is going to be a theme that you see on this list because it's almost as if Tony Khan gets the acclaimed and give credit where it's due and you give blame to where it's due because Tony Khan's the man in charge. He, you know, gets them to the point um, where they're super popular. And this happened a couple Mm -hmm. times. And then afterwards, it's like, all right. And there was that also that weird undercurrent that you can't help but wonder, like, what was this all about? Where you got FTR off, you know, off TV, uh, FTR bald with his podcast, you know, essentially it sounds like just sort of publicly whining about the state of, of, of his team. And then they come back and like, let's just get them back on FTR. Yeah. Look, FTR is a terrific tag team, some of the best wrestlers on the planet, but if you can't figure out how to, because the acclaimed fit those titles so well, oh yeah, FTR, they can have their five-star matches without the titles. Yeah. They can get any number of feuds. AEW has a loaded roster where you can figure out 
uh, uh, some stories for them away from the titles, and then at some point, just bite the bullet and do FTR versus the Acclaimed and figure it out. I know, and here's another thing with the FTR coming back. It was only a, a matter of months later that CM Punk was coming back, you know, and, and they got their CM FTR thing. Have them as a trio go do things. Yeah, right. Not involving yeah. the tag titles. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's for me is the real head scratching part of it. Like, is like if Punk's coming back, you have him team with FTR. You have them do stuff together. Mm-hmm. Tag titles don't need to be involved. Yeah, yeah. It just yeah. and there seemed like for months, especially when Collision launched, it was like, all right, FTR's got the tag titles. They ain't doing anything with them. Mm-hmm. Nothing interesting happening. And then when they dropped them, it was just like, hey, we need to pop a number for Collision. Let's have a surprise title change without any sort of like real build involved. Yeah. And I'm sure not a thousand percent sure, but it seems likely FTR might very well get those titles back before full gear. So we can get young bucks FTR four on November 18th. The young bucks will win that one in LA or, or they'll do a thing where, because they want to avoid a direct FTR versus young bucks, oh, a triple threat, huh? They might do that as well. Yeah. Anyways, that's uh that's for the future. But yeah, the acclaim losing those tag titles, you just feel the air. And look, I like the guns. I think they're terrific. That time, that place, not the time for them. No. Uh let's move on to number nine. Nine. The Nightmare Collective. Oh, early AEW. They're throwing all sorts of shit at the wall to see what stuck. And you know what? Yeah. That was actually one element of early AEW that I always appreciated. You know, there was a lot of energy. Got all these new faces, a couple of old faces. Let's see what's going to work. Let's turn Brandy into a cult leader. Why not? Now, yeah. Brandy Rhodes, her role as on screen and off screen uh, chief brand officer. Mm hmm. Um, I thought she fills that type of role very well. She's very much got the vibe of a politician, much like Cody Rhodes. Um, and uh, cult leader, uh, just, 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 just spewing, just really corny dialogue. Yeah, doesn't really fit what she. Well, was here's doing. the thing, too. Here's the problem with all these kind of charismatic leader groups and characters is that very, very rarely. Is there is there a mission statement? Is there a manifesto? Yeah, this right. is what we're setting out to do mm-hmm. in this particular wrestling promotion. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we saw it with Sanity and NXT, and later on main roster, we saw it with the Nightmare Collective. There's probably other instances I can think of if I put my brain to it. Yeah, and without that manifesto, that mission statement, you're like, well, what's the point? What's mm-hmm. their purpose? Yeah. What are they trying to achieve? You know, when it was, you know, Awesome Kong would beat somebody and then cut off a piece of their hair and 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 then then mel you know attacked her there she was a fan booked initially and then she joined and it was and then and then luther was in the group for some reason and yeah just, they were it, they were trying to recruit statlin or somebody made a playlist yeah. of all their all their stuff and the the one running thread through everything was the complete and total lack of crowd reaction yes. um it's especially disheartening because it just sort of buried awesome kong immediately and I, I don't know the full story of like what happened i know that there was an interview that you had linked here where brandy yeah, talked with about Wrestling observer Live, how yeah. yeah with wrestling observer radio yeah how um she was supposed to just be the manager to awesome kong which sounds like it could have been pretty cool mm-hmm. and then somewhere along the way you know the nightmare collective became a part of that and like you said and that's a good point the idea of like why are you here as opposed to just you know, very cryptic. You know, anybody can can spew cryptic nonsense. I know. Uh, it it's got to mean something, and exactly. you, you got to know what what's at stake here. And you know, she tried to recruit Statland, and it was kind of obvious that you know Brandy might have been having fun playing this role up, but it just didn't really come off as necessarily believable or genuine. And you you got Awesome Kong there. You got to do something much better with her. Mm-hmm. Um, and the crowd wasn't into it. Uh, there was also at the time, you know, the early Dark Order, which had also cultish vibes to it. You yeah. had like the Butcher of the Blade and, and the Bunny coming in, also yeah. kind of cultish vibes. Yeah, and that was that was kind of like a, a something that kind of was an offshoot of Nightmare Collective too, because that 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 the alley becoming the bunny happened after mm-hmm. she got a haircut off. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, right, um, right. At least with dark order, you know, the, like those video packages they ran. All right. I know their purpose. I know mm-hmm. what they're trying to achieve. You know, mm-hmm. they're on a recruiting effort. 
at least they have that going. Yeah. They didn't well, have much like else the, going from a the early, standpoint. early Dark Order, yeah. when it was like a bunch of creepers and stuff, it was like, oh, yeah, what yeah, is yeah, happening yeah. right oh, here? Yeah, you're right. They yeah. did. They shifted pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, to like whatever they were a Ponzi scheme or whatever, but uh, but yeah, no, that actually be kind of a cool angle. That would Ponzi be interesting. Scheme. Um, so yeah, and then and then I guess it was like uh, when Cody loads Cody Cody loads when Cody Rhodes was getting his lashes, Brandy yeah. came out and to try to protect him, and that sort of signified the end of the Nightmare Collective. It was done at yeah. that point. Um, Luther went off and started uh, teaming with uh, was Serpentico, Serpentico, I think. Yeah, Chaos Project. Yeah, and then Mel just sort of disappeared. Yeah, Chaos. Yeah, and then Mel disappeared, and Awesome Kong was out. She she went to go film Glow, I think. Yeah. Um, well, then you know she talked about with Chris Van Vliet, you know, not feeling like she wasn't heard in terms of mm, yeah creative aspects. You know, we t- we did a, a episode not long ago on uh, AEW uh, ball drops in terms of talent that you know they didn't maximize the potential uh, that they you know from a creative standpoint. And we talked about that interview with Chris Van Vliet where she felt like, yeah, I was trying to get on these meetings where decisions were being made and never had a chance. This episode of Going and Raw is sponsored by BetterHelp Steve. Yes. I know you know this because I've talked about it all week, but one of the things that irritates me most about dealing with anxiety is when I'm in a situation, whether it's something I want to do or I should do or I need to do, but this brain inside my head starts going and my anxiety kicks up and it makes it extremely difficult to get those things done if, if I get them done at all. Yeah, man, absolutely. And I know you know this, but therapy can help you figure out what's holding you back so you work for yourself rather than against yourself. Yes, I know about that. I've been there before. Back in my mid-20s, my anxiety got really, really bad. So bad, in fact, that I realized... It was getting in the way of me living a productive, happy life, and I needed to go to therapy. It took me a couple tries to find someone I felt comfortable talking to, but once I did, I was able to learn the tools I needed to better cope with my anxiety and get me back on track to being a happier, more productive Larson. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's completely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. All you got to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash raw today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash raw. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Number eight. Eight. Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss. Remember their cool, like, Miami Vice-esque uh, shit was promos? I know. It was great. It was shot beautifully. The vibe was, like, the energy that shit had was so good. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, that was cool stuff. Now, um, there was a kind of a surprising, uh, uh, what is it, benefactor? No. Yeah, benefactor. Yeah, benefactor is the right word, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Behind all these things. And it was, of course, Larson. My favorite should be your favorite, Cody, Cody, Cody stinking Rhodes. This is what Joey Janela said on the sessions with Renee Paquette. Again, early AW, he says this, Cody, I think he was just throwing shit at a wall. There was a big show coming up in Jersey at the Prudential Center. That was the one that got canceled due to COVID. They were like the first blood and gut show, I think. Right, right, right. He says uh, they were like, what do we do with Joey and Sonny Kiss? It's a hometown gig for them. Let's just team them up. So that show got canceled, and every and eventually with COVID, I think Cody was like, let's just roll with it. So I said, oh, I got this idea for vignettes. They're like 1980s like Miami Vice, but the dynamic is so different become, because I'm the cis white male, and Sonny Kiss is the flamboyant representative of the LGBTQ community. And I wanted to tell a story where I was down on my luck that I did these matches with Moxley. I did these matches with Omega that were world-renowned. Everyone was talking about him, and then COVID happened, and I was in shambles. Sonny Kiss is like, I'm from Jersey, you're from Jersey, let's get back on our feet together. So Cody, out of his own pocket, paid for these vignettes that seriously took like 15 hours to film. They showed it to Tony. Tony hated it. Tony thought they were phony, fake. He hates the invisible camera, hates the cinematic stuff, which they've done a lot more. But maybe it's just because it was uh, with me, and they knew I was actually going to get over this time. Everyone loved it, and we got it on TV and like a certain kind of edited down version of what we put out, and it still got people talking about it like all over. It was trending on Twitter, this video, 
Eric Bischoff, he was watching and said, that was one of the greatest promo videos I've ever seen in my life. He said, this was really awesome, but that wasn't the intention Tony had with us. So we didn't like the video. And from there, we kind of like, you know, we wrestled Brody Lee and Colt Cabana. And I think it was one of Brody's first matches on TV. We did that. And that was it. Larson, I love these videos. I thought they yeah. were cool. I thought that the pairing of these two, an oddball couple, but you could see in the vignettes what their dynamic would sort of be like. And I thought that was really neat. And the fact that they didn't explore it. And the fact that Tony didn't like these things is really kind of bizarre to me. Yeah, that is strange. And if if the the the, the reasoning that Tony Khan gave behind not liking it was like, I don't like the cinematic stuff. What? Mm, yeah. That's a bit head scratching. So maybe Janela is onto something is that maybe Tony Khan, even though he signed Janela to a contract, just didn't have designs to do much with them. I don't know. I, I mean, mean, he put them yeah. in some high profile matches like the I think it was at Fighter Fest where Janela had that match with with Mox. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. And then he fought Kenny, I think, on Dark. Yeah. You know, dude, it's it's like anything else. You never know what the other side of that particular thing is. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, as a wrestler, I'm sure it's incredibly frustrating, especially oh, yeah. Joey Janela, who seemed to be also one of the like ambassadors to the indie world for yeah. AEW. He's a very yeah. important part of AEW. And from his perspective, to be treated a certain way and dismissed like that has got to be incredibly frustrating we don't know the other side of it, like Absolutely. what Tony saw in him or didn't see in him. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I thought these vignettes were really cool, and I thought they there were. was a lot you could do with these characters. It seemed like a very unique pairing that you know we hadn't seen something like this before. Yeah, yeah, I remember when they they, they first uh, were on TV and just yeah, I mean whoever Cody whoever Cody paid to 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 make these did an awesome job. They look great. They really they did. Were, yeah, they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was so different than than anything else going on, certainly in AEW. Mm -hmm. um, and it got me excited yeah. to to see Sonny and Joey tag and see what they can do. And it just didn't really go anywhere. And then they had a, a pretty protracted feud on on Dark and Elevation. Yeah, it was a shame that that story never made its way to television. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and now both Sonny and, and Joey are, are gone from AEW. Yeah. Sonny's although Sonny just showed up in Impact. And that's in great. Impact. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool for Sunny. Uh, anyways, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Number seven. Seven. The Jade Cargill Bow Wow feud. I don't, really, I don't really know. What supposed to, I don't even know what this is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's the thing. It's like, know. okay, I get it. Bow Wow. Celebrity. But I know. I mean, maybe not. I mean, he's of, he's of, more famous than us. Yeah, and but not at the height of his fame, obviously. Right. Yeah, you know, and 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 they're trying to. I'm trying to give AEW the benefit of the doubt here, even though this doesn't seem like a great idea. They're like, okay, we want we see Jade as a superstar, who sh and so we should involve her with other superstars. And so they there's a Twitter beef started with her and Bow Wow. Mm -hmm, yeah. And like there's that the the thing where she shows up at his concert, I think it was in Miami, mm -hmm. you know, and there's like that altercation and then he shows up on the Tron and cuts the promo on Dynamite and that's it. There's nothing yeah, right. else. Yeah. That's yeah. the end that's the extent of it. Yeah. And and uh Jade was on the bootleg Kev podcast and it was asked, Hey, what's the deal with this? And she just said, I don't know what happened with it. Something was supposed to happen, it didn't happen, he moved on from the situation. Hmm. I mean, it, it, it's kind of just kind of emblematic of uh, of Tony Khan's creative approach with Jade Cargill while in AEW. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Like, well, if I can't put her in squash matches, he seemed like to have no idea what to do with her from a creative standpoint. Yeah, and look, I, I can I can absolutely understand booking somebody like Jade, somebody who you you want to protect, somebody who is a larger than life character that yeah I, I i don't get it like i i understand that you want like the streak was the thing with jade you know you wanted this goldberg type streak mm -hmm. there are certain people who just like that makes sense it makes a lot of sense for her the streak yeah. made a absolutely lot of sense. sense yeah and i can absolutely understand that if your one rule is this person can't lose 
That's a pretty big rule to to write around. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, even with Goldberg, like it, it you know, I, I'm look, I'm not saying Eric Bischoff is like a creative genius, although I don't even know if he had the book. It might I forget I don't know who had the book, like when when Goldberg, it might have been Sullivan. I, I forget who it was. But my point is traditionally speaking, it's never easy to book stories around a streak because yeah. for most wrestlers it's more compelling when they lose, when they look vulnerable and then have to overcome odds. Yes. That being said, he was exceptionally lazy with Jade's booking. Um, you know, she started out with the Shaq stuff. Bow Wow is like a... Yeah. Yeah. For the audio crowd. <laughs> for, the vid- for the video crowd, you can see my hand going all the way down. Yeah, it's, it's 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 quite a few steps down in terms of public celebrity at that point. In their it careers. is, yes. And yes. one of Jade's, you know, and she's been very diplomatic about it since then. She wanted to mix it up with the larger stars in the women's division, and they didn't really let her do that. No, and we'll get um, to that more in another mm, entry yeah. here coming up. But there yeah. seemed to be a perfect opportunity, yeah, for her to get involved in the main event scene. But it seemed like they 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 had that TBS title tournament. They put the belt on her and it was like, all right, that's that's our intercontinental champion for the women's division and she's gonna carry that title until she doesn't. And mm-hmm. that was yeah. kind of the creative for her. I mean yeah. there was the Nyla Rose story which was fun mm-hmm. where Nyla stole the belt and there were some funny bits from that. Um but otherwise there's from a creative standpoint there just wasn't much there you know, and, and, and having Mark Sterling with Jade, it was a it was an odd pairing and it didn't really work. Yeah. And Mark can, can do some fun stuff, but when you got Mark with Jade, but you also got him with with uh, Josh Woods and Tony Nice who lose all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, am I supposed to take this guy seriously or no? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But uh yeah, I I don't know what's supposed to happen with something. Look, I'll be honest with you. The botch here might have been starting this feud in the first place, and maybe yes. the the recovery was just dropping was, it, you know, sparing it, yeah. no, us from whatever this would have been. Whatever yeah. it was going to be, because who knows? I mean, I imagine the scenario would have been Bow Wow would have found somebody to wrestle mm-hmm. Jade, I would, mm-hmm. I would guess. A proxy of some sort, yeah. Yeah, whether that, that, that wrestler was an AEW, someone they were going to bring in, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Uh, they moved on from Bow Wow. Let's move on to number six. Six. Will Hobbs joins QTV. Oh, my God. Man, gosh. I remember being there. And famously, yeah. we refer to it as the Sacramento Dynamite because, in fact, it was Dynamite in Sacramento. It was after a pay-per-view. But, hey, man, we're Sacramento. We might not get all the best things. We're not Los Angeles or New York, you know. But God, can you drop us a good Dynamite maybe? Nah, nah. Uh, but the main event did see Will Hobbs beat Wardlow for the TNT title. However... He did it with the assistance of QT Marshall. Uh, and then we find out more about this alliance in, in, uh, in, the, week, in the weeks afterwards. And it didn't get any better. It got quite a bit worse because then uh, they did this horrible uh, ripoff of TMZ. And these vignettes were, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Like, I don't know. When did TMZ became a thing on TV? Like 10 years ago? Oh, it might have been longer than that. They've been I, around for quite a while. I want to say like 15 years ago, but I don't know. Time is a flat circle as far as I'm concerned. Um, 2005. But 2005. Oh, my God. Wow. So, yeah. Dated, to say the least. And yes. it just, none of it seemed to really make a lot of sense, largely because they didn't try to make it make sense. It was like, you know, okay, is Hobbs just using Q, uh, uh, QT Sorry, Marshall? 2007 yeah. is when the TV show made its debut. Okay, so 16 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there there didn't really seem to be a concrete this. I'm, I'm, you're doing this for me. I'm going to do this for you. This transaction makes sense. Instead, like QT was just more interested in doing this really lame comedy bit. Yeah. And like Hobbs was just sort of there along for the ride. And we're waiting for him to spine buster the hell out of QT Marshall, like 
Transaction complete. I'm going back to the Book of Hobbes stuff. I got what I wanted yes. out of you. Exactly. But that exactly. didn't really come. Like they no, teased they, it. They he, teased it, but never came to fruition. Yeah, like he you did. Know, he did turn on him. Yeah. Kind of, but like they never even followed up on that. Like they never had no. like a Hobbs QT Marshall match. No, they, no, they never did. Um, and like they tried to justify the pairing in that going back to the Starks feud that Hobbs had where uh, he enlisted the help or sorry, QT was trying to like, hey, we'll help you. We'll mm -hmm. help you out with Starks. That it was, you know, uh, something involving that. It was Hobbs was doing some interesting stuff. Yeah. Before QTV, they had those really great vignettes. Those were cool. Telling his backstory. He was doing the book of Hobbs stuff. Yeah. You know, and it would have made, they really could have done something interesting if rather than having Hobbs join up with QT, and I know I've said this before, you have Samoa Joe in the QT Marshall spot at that dynamite. Mm -hmm. Cost and Warlow the match directly. They can go off and, and continue their feud that was going for the TNT title. Hobbs wins the TNT championship. He gets to hold it for a while mm -hmm. while Wardlow and Joe finish their thing up. Maybe Wardlow gets in a couple more feuds. So you start to process the building Wardlow back up. Yeah. Hobbs won that title to facilitate Wardlow's story, not to advance or push Hobbs up the card. Yeah. And right. that's the huge issue with it. And yeah. and and I I hope I hope they're not repeating that same mistake with this Jericho stuff. Man, I hope I hope you're right. I hope they're not also. But you can't help but think, what they do? They just stuck him in another faction, a Don Callis family this time. And, you know, they had they had something with that Miro stuff. And instead, like, they're just having Miro kind of feud with CJ instead. And it's like, you can, if you just give a little bit of effort to this, you can rope Hobbs into that. Um, I thought, you know, given that thematically, they both refer to what could be thought of as religious elements, the Redeemer who talks directly to God, um, yeah. and and the Book of Hobbes. I thought like as a tag team, they that could have been interesting. And then they yeah. feud again. There's, you know, those two characters I think have a lot to offer in yeah. their own journey. And you keep on putting them with these goofball, you know. I mean, the Callis family is whatever. I like Don Callis. The but, Callis family is a step, a major step up from QTV. It, it is. It, no, it absolutely is. It is. But you just, I just get the feeling he's going to get lost in the shuffle there. Yeah. Jericho's yeah, going to get a final sure. win over Hobbs. And it's like, why? No. Uh uh. Like, I know. Jericho should go through all this reflection only to get beat worse by Hobbs next time. Mm -hmm. That's how it mm -hmm. should go. And then he's like, I don't want any mm -hmm. part of this guy. Because it's been so many already. It's been so many like starts and stops with Hobbs that it's like people are just going to not believe that he is anything to, to, to care about if they keep. Yeah. And that's been, again, like I said, that's been sort of the thing with AEW is like follow through, see things yeah. through, you yep. know, and they yep. have a hard time doing that. It's that and capitalizing on momentum for sure. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure. Uh, let's move on now to number five. Five. Hangman Page feuds with CM Punk. Now, so, you know, initially when we talked about putting Hangman's title reign on here, that's what I had at first, and I thought about it. Mm -hmm, sure. And and this was kind of the fulcrum point, this feud with Phil. I'm not even talking about the backstage stuff. You know, the, yeah. the Colt Cabana, the, the workers' rights line in the, in the program. I'm not even talking about that. That's a whole separate thing. Mm-hmm. Talking about whether it's a wise idea to have Hangman feud with CM Punk full stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Hangman's title reign was a lot of really good matches, but not necessarily a through line that connected the stories together. Yeah. You know, you can maybe say, well, his story as champ is he was learned to be champion. Because mm -hmm. with Adam Cole, Adam Cole is like, are you willing to do whatever it takes to hold in that title? Mm -hmm. Danielson, it was like, I'm going to put you through the ringer and, and make you bleed a lot and put you through some really good matches. Kind of the same deal with Lance Archer. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the extent of it. Yeah. And so you had this awesome build for Hangman winning the title. And at that point, it's like, okay, well, what's next? Again, capitalizing on momentum. What kind of stories do you get him involved in to carry that momentum of winning that title? And that seemed to be the missing element. Enter CM Punk now. If you have Hangman beat CM Punk, ah, maybe there there's direction. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this hot uh, guy, this hot guy who signed from who returned from wrestling after being gone from WWE ten years. He's the talk of the wrestling business, 
and 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 Hangman beats them. Maybe even do a through line. I know Hangman talked about this in his promo with Punk. Like I'm defending AEW from you, and that's Hangman's mission statement. Mm-hmm. We have all these guys coming in from WWE. You know, Archer kind of. Although I know he was a WWE years ago, but um, we have all these ex WWE guys, and Danielson and Cole, and now Punk coming in to my company. Mm-hmm. I'm one of the founded fathers of AEW. Mm-hmm. Come to my company, trying to win my belt. Nah, nah. Yeah. So I have to defend my company from these people coming in and trying to make this company theirs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the story, and you could really follow through with that with CM Punk. Obviously, yeah. they were not on the same page creatively going into this. Yeah, no, I, I um, feel you though that that was a really tough spot to be in because it seemed clear. Okay, CM Punk is a hot deal. You know, he, he he's a, a draw. I guess they have him on the cover of the video game. That plus Delta. Eventually, he wasn't. He was the plus Delta exactly. And so it, you just knew as soon as as soon as he got there with Page. Okay, they're just going to put the title on Punk. I know. Tony Khan got bored of Hangman Page. He loves the fact that CM Punk is there. He's going to put the title on him. And imagine, dude, could you imagine for a second if they put the level of effort and complexity into Hangman Page's title run that they gave either Kenny or now MJF, who's got a title reign that's actually pretty damn good Mm -hmm. because he got there. It's so unpredictable. You got all these elements coming after him. And I do, I do really wonder if MJF is just booking this stuff himself. Like that we sort be. of heard that, that because he's the, very heavily involved. The level of character development that MJF has undergone during the course of his nearly year long title reign has been awesome. It has been great. It, it's been Whereas really Hangman really just cool. stopped drinking. That was kind of his character development, you know? Yeah. And dude, there was so much material there to work with for him because I, I remember when, you know, the that, that exchange went down and you and I were trying to piece together what does this mean and you're like oh it's hangman he's wilting at the pre under pressure of being champion now there's this guy who's wildly more over than he is how is he going to handle this but no it's just they weren't on the same page no um and so yeah if if they had if they had actually put some care and effort as much as they did in the story of hangman page getting to that point then they might have really had something with Hangman yep. because the the you know as a character and as a as a performer, Hangman Page has got a lot going for him and he had some Absolutely. really interesting stuff going for him. He did, and and from the inception of AEW, it seemed obvious that Hangman was the guy they wanted to build to be. Yeah, right. If not face of the company, at least the ace a, of the company. consistent main eventer, the ace of the company. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a perennial championship contender. Yeah, right. And to to take that much time into developing Hangman's character and just kind of throw it away. They put the belt on CM Punk. Mm-hmm, I know it, it. 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 I don't feel like it really. It didn't necessarily benefit either of them. No, yeah, that really storyline didn't benefit either of them. Yeah, you know. And if it maybe is a situation where if if Hangman if Hangman could have dropped the title even to a heel because mm-hmm. putting Hangman, who's supposed to be one of your top baby faces, up against Punk in that time. Yeah. It was kind of a no-win scenario. For it him. really was, yeah. And postponed Punk's title reign for a year. Wait till the following year at All Out because it was going to happen in Chicago mm-hmm. or whenever they have Dynamite in Chicago before uh, Thanksgiving. Have the title change there. Have someone else beat Hangman. Have Adam Cole beat Hangman. Heal Adam Cole beat Hangman. Or MJF. Point. Or MJF. You know, yeah. Somebody. Yeah. You know, and have then have CM Punk take the title off. Mm-hmm. whoever beats hangman that mm-hmm. would have made a lot more sense in a lot of respects yeah 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 you could have you could have done mjf and then you revisit punk versus mjf the next yep. year and yep. and there, there's a perfect story for you right there yep but uh but yeah they didn't said we got just a bunch of awkwardness and everybody knows the rest yep. let's move on to number four or the outcasts versus the homegrown talents boy oh, wow. oh boy you know when i think about when Soraya came in and made all these promises about, you know, uh, change and things happening. And then when you look at the state of AEW now and just see how everybody seems to be on their own Island and there's no continuity between with the exception, maybe of the fact that sky blue and Willow got misted, uh, you know, there's something there, but like beyond that, it's all just sort of a mess. And you look at the opportunity they had when Tony Storm teamed up with Soraya and Soraya comes in and, you know, people pop for her. But you sort of realize, oh, wait, she's kind of a bad guy. Like she's not she's got a bone to pick 
with the homegrown talents. So her and Tony Storm team up. Ruby Soho then joins them. And it's like, oh, we get it. Okay, they're the outsiders, the outcasts. They finally became the outcasts. And you've got this crop of homegrown. And granted, you know, I think homegrown and people who had made a name outside of AEW, but not necessarily here like in America where the show was broadcast, like Hikaru Shida, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you have probably next to the acclaimed, the biggest homegrown talent they have in Jade Cargill. And they don't do a big three on three blow off between Britt Baker, Statlander, because that was the main feud, and uh and and Jade Cargill uh against the outcasts, or you could have even added Athena to the outcasts, and then you have room for Hikaru Shida in that that big four on four do blood and guts. They let the the women do the big uh super bloody street fights. So let them do a blood and guts match or some big four on four blow off where it's like, you don't know who's aligned with who, who's going to choose sides. And the, and, and it's just sort of fizzled into nothing. It did. it did. It was a situation where, you know, we, we had been critical up to that point, And we've been critical since of Tony Khan's booking of the women's division. Yeah. In terms of not giving them enough TV time, not enough matches, not enough opportunities to tell stories. And then when they introduced the outcast, we're like, Oh, here's an opportunity to tell a huge story yeah. that can uh, involve not just the three members of the outcast and whatever three to five homegrown talents they decide to book that week. Mm -hmm. This can be a story that can, that can, that can, that can involve basically the entire women's division Yeah, where everybody's put in a position where they have to choose sides. Yeah. You know, this could be the outcast could be to AEW what the NWO was to WCW. You know, you have, you have Soraya, you have Tony, you have Ruby who are like, we're better because we are in WWE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and, and to bring in other former WWE talents to join the outcasts. And then you have the homegrown talent standing up for AEW. You could have involved so many more people in that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they just didn't. It just, that was the frustrating out. aspect because this could have been a story that, that could have turned around, that could have turned around the women's division in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. If they had just dedicated the time and the creative energy to, developing and telling an interesting story yeah and it was just such a massive fumble that that didn't happen yeah yeah it, it was just um you know and, and it was one of those things where you know i i get the i have the suspicion that tony khan just looks at at maybe the numbers that he thinks the women you know bring in and he says oh they're not a draw at some point you have to put in the work that's to and and understand that they can be and they would be if you put in the work. It's so easy to sign a Danielson, a Cole, a Punk, whatever, and oh, they've got a pre-existing fan base. We're gonna slot them in. We're gonna feature them heavily because they're former WWE people. They're they're already gonna do this. You bring in the women. And immediately, like, you just don't do anything with them. And it's like, you got to put in the work at some point. Exactly. And, and, that is and the he thing. just doesn't do it. You know, the, the, you, you get by so far on brand recognition and notoriety by signing in a huge name. Sure, they'll get a number, you know, established talents like Danielson or Mox or Jericho or maybe Adam Copeland. That remains up, up in the air. Yeah. Um, we'll get a number. Everybody else, you have to put in the time to develop and develop yeah. interesting stories. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you're, you're saying if they have those names now, and look yeah. what's happening because they're not putting in the effort for for stories. I don't know why Tony Khan doesn't look at Orange Cassidy. Yeah, someone who had no, you know, like if you pay attention to the independents, you knew who Orange Cassidy was. You might have heard the name. But when he showed up on AEW, I'm guessing a vast majority of their audience had no idea who he was. You're probably right, yeah. And and you know he he wasn't exactly booked as a winning wrestler mm -hmm. early on. It wasn't mm -hmm. until he's you look at the YouTube numbers. Wow, his mm -hmm. his videos get tons of views. Yeah, yeah. He was at least given TV time early mm -hmm. on, even if it's just a little bit where he's standing in the bathroom during a yeah. backstage brawl. You yeah. know, like he was given opportunities to showcase who he was as a character early on, even if he wasn't wrestling. Mm -hmm, yeah. And people are like, this guy's funny. This guy's entertaining. I'm going to pay attention to him. I want to watch his videos on YouTube. 
oh, he's on the show. I'm going to tune in. And I, I just don't know how Tony Khan can't see, okay, here's an example of someone who, who established their brand on our show mm -hmm. and developed a following because of it. Mm -hmm. And then we put it, because we gave him opportunities to be on TV, he was able to develop his brand, and then a, a, a fan base grew from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they put in some effort into developing Orange Cassidy. Yeah, right, yeah. Like, why isn't that amount of, of care and detail given to everybody on the roster? Yeah. Those opportunities, at least give them an opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so often they'll sign somebody and they'll be on TV for three weeks and be gone for two months. Yeah. You Not how it works. In, you got to put in the effort. You got to put in the effort. You got to get these people and you got to allow them an opportunity to showcase who they are as a character and get them involved in interesting stories. Mm -hmm. And people will tune in to what they're doing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really feel like rocket science. I'm not saying it's not, it's, it's, it's easy. Yeah. You know, because well, sometimes you got to crack the right story for the right character, but at the same time, it's like the formula, I feel like, is there. He has enough people. The problem is, he, or he, the thing is, he's got enough people working under him in creative. Mm -hmm. Guys like Jimmy Jacobs, you know, and others, um, Madison Rain, that are familiar with that formula, with the weekly television formula. They've yeah. worked in those, in, in you know, in that yeah. uh, setting before. And I, it, it just, for whatever reason, there's there's no connection there. Yeah. You know, uh, let's go ahead and move on to a guy who I think probably was the connection there. Number three. Three. Cody's heel turn. Now, I said this before, and I'll be honest with you. This should be like my ultimate victory lap. You talk about early AEW weekly television that was done right. Well, Cody Rhodes was sitting right there at the gorilla position as soon as he's gone guess what happens it all goes away but that's neither here nor there because we're going to talk about thing, the other the other huge difference is there was a massive focus and a through line in a in a, a in an obvious a program with the kenny hangman young buck stuff that that wasn't exactly carrying the show but was the primary focus of a good many episodes of dynamite and that was a really strong story once yeah. that ended it kind of correlated when cody left uh, yeah, well, when he left, clearly things fell apart, but uh, we'll talk about this. Cody leaving. Uh, it wasn't exactly like Cody was 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 uh, hitting home runs left and right from a creative standpoint, Steve. No, uh, he was trying something different, and I feel like, you know, the, the AEW fan base, perhaps not sophisticated enough to understand exactly what, he, was doing. what he says here. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we all remember, Cody Rhodes in AEW, you know, he was one of the hottest uh, uh, members of the elite, certainly the most polished member of the elite in terms of being on cable television because he'd done it before in WWE. And uh, and so, of course, he was one of the hottest acts coming into the creation of AEW. Uh, and and then uh, he just he just went too far with it with like, you know, is he a bad guy? Is he going to be a bad guy? He would tease being a bad guy. Uh, and And he had an actual answer about what was going on with Cody Rhodes and AEW? Because people were hella booing that guy. Uh, and and we had a lot of questions. And he might have had an answer here. This is an interview with Ariel Helwani he did. Uh, these transcripts are on, uh, from Fightful. He says, I'll give you an example. The number one thing a heel is supposed to do is take something away. The mm. crowd wants to see something. They're stomping their feet and clapping their hands. You take it away. You have to know when to give it to them. And if you take it. Oh, Sorry, you have to know when to give it to them if you take it away. The last deal run that I had, the number one thing they wanted me to do was turn heel. The number one thing I, I could do was say, I'm never going to turn heel, which makes me a heel. If people need further proof that this wasn't some revisionist history, look at the matches I was having. I'm bumping and feeding. Yeah, we throw the weight belt into the crowd and it gets thrown back. Then we do a dog pile spot 30 seconds later. Those aren't things that you do on the fly. Maybe it was a bit too nuanced for any audience, and maybe it was a scenario where I just swing and miss. You never know, because I think people thought I was adamant about not turning, and that's not a real thing. You have to go with what they give you. I had two years of wonderful babyface hoorah, and that was a nice way to go out there at the end. Here in WWE, though, I don't love the idea of being a heel here. Something could present itself, and what you put out there is I haven't thought about it at all. It's different because I mentioned this younger audience. If they believe I have to stick to that more than a smaller section of the audience. So I don't know if I agree with his premise here. I don't know if I agree with his premise that the number one job of a heel is to take something away. I understand that's part of it. 
I understand that how that plays into development of a quality heel, but I don't think you can reduce being a heel to, oh, I got to take something away. There's more to it. Look, this is a shoot. I am not going to disagree with Cody Rhodes on anything in terms of how to be a wrestler. <laughs> I ain't going to go there, but I respect your opinion. I, you know, man, I think I, I look, I do think that it's sort of silly to say this was too nuanced for the audience. Yes. A failure is a failure. Yes. The bottom line, you can't blame that on the audience. Cody Rhodes is a professional wrestler who's got the Absolutely. pedigree. Obviously, he's a very Obviously. smart guy. He knows better than than I do, certainly. That being said, you got to take the blame. And if you say, I was trying something a little bit different and it didn't connect. That's what happened here. He was trying something different and it didn't connect. Yes. So, like, I, I do believe that that was his intention, though. I do think oh, that. Oh, I do believe that, too. I his believe, intention you know, it, was to be a heel, but not be, ex like, he, all the pedigree teases where I thought I thought were awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look through the prism of his approach, which is, you have an expectation, I'm going to take away that expectation. Yeah. Given the reaction I'm getting, you expect me to turn heel? No, I'm not going to turn heel. Therefore, that's a heel move. I get what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And if that was his philosophy, it's, I see that. I see the through line. I just don't know if, especially given what we saw on TV, if that kind of uh, uh, kind of one-note philosophy was enough to get him where he wanted to be. And I guess that's why I say I disagree with his premise in that if his whole idea of, like, I'm going to heal, so I'm just not going to give him what they want when they think they want it. Yes, that's part of it. But if you really want to connect with an audience, I know we criticize pro wrestling tropes all the time. They're, you got to dabble in those on occasion because that's those you got to meet the fans' expectations at some point. Well, you know, I remember those conversations with you back then. We would ask ourselves, does Cody understand what he's doing here? Because it seemed like he lacked self awareness. That was the thing, right? But that was the thing. <laughs> According to Cody Rhodes, I just see here's the thing. We are nuanced enough to understand Larson. Yeah, we, did, we understood it. We did understand. It was just like, it was just too weird. You're getting too avant-garde with the exactly. pro wrestling stuff when you're supposed, you're on cable television, man. Nobody in WCW back in the day was, no, was playing with the very, you know, uh, uh, is, uh, conventions of heel and face. This is where you're supposed to be broad with this stuff, Cody. Yeah. Like you are now as a baby face. Yeah. You're like indulging in every Mm -hmm. baby face wrestling trope right now at WWE. Oh, yeah. Every single one. Yeah, look at how wonderful Cody. it's working out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it works great. Too. Like I said, I think to a degree, I'm like, look, he's a professional wrestler. He's a highly successful one. I'm not going to his face and say, Cody, you were wrong in this instance. <laughs> yeah. But here watching the product and seeing how it turned out and this is his philosophy, I can be like, I'm going to quibble with that a little bit. Yeah, I quibble with the, you can't, you can't blame the audience on this one. You can't yeah. claim the audience. It was, yeah. it was a, in politician speak, it was a muddied message. The messaging yes. was off here. Yes, it was. Anyways, that was fun. Let's talk about number two. Two. Swerve and Keith Lee. <sighs> what mm. the fuck? Where? Oh. This one is exceptionally yeah, remember frustrating. Their, we're, we're remember like their big blow off match? <laughs> no, we're a year. We're about a year oh from when they they split up. Let me see. Yeah. When did the cinder block thing happen? It was after they lost to the acclaim. Oh, my gosh. So it might be more than a year at this juncture. So, of course, Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland had all sorts of history together. And uh, and so when they teamed up, people loved to see it. They're were, they were a wildly fun tag team. They're over. And their dynamic was when it was interesting. Swerve, obviously, as we see now, a bit more of the X-Factor type, kind of a Pillman-esque guy, not Pillman Jr. Um, and Keith Lee, you know, Keith Lee, the basically like, you know, the badass uncle or the badass dad yeah. that everybody loves yeah. in wrestling yeah. and to see them interact so much fun. And you see like, you know, a little tension here and there. And then the split happens and, and swerve stomps a concrete cinder block on, on Keith Lee's chest. Uh, and then Keith Lee comes back eventually and teams with Dustin Rhodes. Doesn't make any sense. None yeah, of that makes sense. sense. Again, almost a year, maybe more than a year. I don't know exactly when the cinder block bit happened. Uh, roughly a year from that happening, and they have yet to have a singles one-on-one -on -one match. They've, they've faced off in tag matches. They were forced to team together Yeah. again after all this. But 
not a singles match. Not a, any singles match have come out of this. So Melser spoke about it. This, I think this is the most recent comment or news about it. This is from September. That's what Melser said at Wrestling Observer Radio. Says they're just not going to do it. They already made that call. They're just not going to do it. I know that there's, what was the idea? People think it won't be good. We get not so good matches on TV all the time. Just freaking do it. Why From a storyline perspective, it it's, it's creative malfeasance. This match has not happened. It's nuts. It is absolutely nuts. It's it's one of those things where you see what they're doing with Swerve. And, and look, this, this is honestly one of those things where I've had to sit here and just assume because, as you say, creative malfeasance. I cannot believe that there isn't a good or at least a reason why they didn't do this. You know, I Keith Lee in the past had talked about health issues. Maybe, just maybe, that was preventing him from a one. He's had one-on-one matches. Yeah. He's had, may, uh, maybe, just maybe, maybe, there is a personality conflict backstage and they don't want to they they don't want to be on the same page. We wouldn't know. We wouldn't know unless there's some reporting on it. They, they tagged together after the cinder block thing. They've worked together though. They have. They have. I mean, I, like Keith, yeah. someone tweeted Keith Lee about it and he was like, "It's not my call to make." I think yeah. uh, I saw somewhere where Swerve was asked about it and he just said timing, the timing has to be right. So I, I don't recall when those statements were made. Yeah. Um but it's it's confusing that that match never happened. Yeah, it is. It's it's one. It's the most bizarre feud that was simply draw. That's why it's number two because number one is is just ludicrous. But this is the biggest feud that was simply dropped with no rhyme or reason, and then they teamed them back up. It's like, oh, are they going to do something? No. They did. Well, it was for that tag tournament. That's why yeah. they got. That's what they teamed together. Yeah, so, and then like, you think, okay, maybe, maybe yeah, that yeah, would lead to something, there, yeah. and then it yeah. didn't. Nope. I, I'm I'm at a loss for words. No Same. idea. No idea. Yep. I uh, people think it won't be good. I don't. know. How is that possible? Keith Lee and Sora Strickland are both top of the line wrestlers. They're terrific. Yeah. They're terrific. I don't know how anybody would think that match wouldn't be good. I don't know. That yeah. match would be stellar. I have nothing, nothing more to offer because I, I know, don't I don't, know. It's, it's, it's so bizarre. We've spoken about it so much for the last year. Why that match hasn't happened? I don't know what else there is to say other than it's it's confusing. Yeah, it's beguiling. Yeah, I don't. I, it makes no sense. Don't Zero sense. No sense. Let's go ahead and move on to number one. One. Wardlow's lawsuit angle. So you got this awesome story of Wardlow under the thumb of MJF. In the pinnacle, out of the pinnacle, just his bodyguard, and MJF owns this contract. So you tell this story of this guy who, with a mere everybody, whenever MJF is out there, everybody is hanging on every small facial expression Wardlow's making. Every time Wardlow has to grit his teeth and not beat the shit out of this little punk, and it comes to a head. Wardlow gets an opportunity to get out of his contract. Happens that uh, was a double, double or, nothing. or nothing. And heading into the match, unfortunately, contract backstage disputes between MJF and Tony Khan sort of steal the narrative away from this could be Wardlow's big Batista making moment. Because I remember yeah. I always used to compare, oh, this guy, he could be a Batista type guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because his character work, under MJF was so good. It was really so good. nuanced. It was really good. Yep. And he ends up getting the win over MJF. They opened the, the the card with this match. It felt a little weird because MJF obviously was distracted by the contract stuff. It was kind of a paint by numbers match, but whatever. Wardlow hits that power bomb symphony on him. MJF gets. I'm sorry. MJF takes the loss here. Wardlow's potentially made. It, there was mm-hmm. still something lacking. There was to crown was. that moment in the match. But I feel like that if there was something really good that followed, yeah, I agree. Been like, oh, oh, yeah, it's it, but a minor, you know, blip on a, an otherwise interesting story they told. You know, it wouldn't have yeah. seemed as huge of a deal as it was because what they followed with was Mark Sterling confronting mm. Wardlow with a lawsuit, saying, "I'm representing all the security guards you power bombed over the last few weeks." And we're suing you. 
And I forget momentum how, vampire angle is what this is. I forget how soon after, or if it was during this, where Wardlow proclaimed, "I don't want the world title. I want the TNT title." That was another creative issue. Yes. So like all the basically a lot of Wardlow post that MJF match just completely buried him. And I don't know, you know, I don't know where the Wardlow was that we saw during all that MJF stuff where he could so effectively convey emotions and feelings and complexities with just a minor facial look, but all yeah. of a sudden he became pro wrestler 101. You know what it could be is Wardlow as MJF's bodyguard henchman. That's a very defined role and he maybe just I know this role. Mm -hmm, I know who yeah. I am. I know what my 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 I know who my character is. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was never that conversation once he was uh, freed from his contract with MJF and was actually a member of the AEW roster. Who are you now? Maybe that because it seems like since then there's been four attempts to try to define who he is, and none mm -hmm. of them have really yeah. hit. Yeah, you know, and 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 if it there was going into that MJF match, there was a defined, all right, Wardlow, now you're free. It would have been interesting if they'd reset his record with mm, AEW. Yeah, right, yeah. You're on an AEW contract. Now you're, you're, base, you're a rookie. Yeah. You're just 0-0 yeah. oh oh now. You got to climb to the top. If he had done this, dude, if, who, uh, did Punk win it double or nothing? What was it yes. double or nothing? Yeah, okay, yes. it was Punk, right? Yeah. No, no, Punk won at All Out. He won his title at All Out. He won it All Out? I believe so. And he beat Hangman at all out. It was a double or nothing. It was double or nothing. Yeah, it was double or nothing because then the next night he busted himself up. Yeah, that's right. Had to go. Right. Yeah, leave. Came back for all out. Came back and for all out. And then all out happened. Yes, my mistake. Right. Yes. Okay. So Punk wins a double or nothing. Punk comes out the next night for a celebration or whatever on Dynamite. Wardlow shows up. And CM Punk has a win over Wardlow, that roll up. Mm -hmm. And Wardlow says, not only do I want... You know, and then you're establishing him as a main event threat. Maybe he beats the shit out of CM Punk. And I don't know. I don't know if you do that because you want to keep Wardlow a good guy. But yeah. maybe you have a confrontation where Punk is like, all right, this is what being a world champion is. Let's go ahead and throw hands. And then maybe we find out somehow, some way that Wardlow, in fact, is starting from nothing. And yeah. that match can't happen. I don't know. But well, you, you, could, you, you should do that during the segment, though, where mm -hmm. Warlow comes up to CM Punk. He's like, I here is my new AEW contract because I am actually now an AEW roster. My records reset. This is back when the, 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 the rankings actually kind of mattered. Yeah. So I just want to let you know you're on notice what you yeah. have around your waist. That's the goal. And I'm going to yeah. do whatever t I have to do to get there. You're on bar. Maybe time. O and O yeah. now, but in six months, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot different. Expect to see me again there. Perfect. You're establishing up him up there on the main event level. He's a threat that is lingering in the air for CM Punk. And then you just have him do whatever you want to do. But like for him to say, I don't want the world title. And oh, yeah, uh, these guys are filing a lawsuit against me. He was buried. He was done. He was yeah. done. And oh. I, don't, I have no idea if they're going to be able to get him out of it. I know. As soon as his first major angle after MJF was a lawsuit angle, I'm like, they have no idea what to do with this guy now. Yeah. None. Yeah. Because that's not what you do if you have designs to build this guy up into a legit main eventer. Right. Yeah. You know, instead of saying, I don't want the AEW title, he should have said, I do want that title. I want to get it before MJF gets his hands on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, maybe another aspect of his character is, I need to prove now that I am better than MJF. So whatever goal he has, I need to do it before he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many, so many. Ask or different takes they could have done with his character to make it interesting and to give him interesting stories. They didn't seemingly do any of them. No lawsuit angle with Mark Sterling. That was embarrassing. God, that was, was so bad. It was awful. That was it. Yeah, you you awful. had you had an opportunity here to make a Batista and whoo, boy, imagine and Batista just, won the Royal Rumble and had the thing with with Evolution. The first thing Triple H did is I'm going to file a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Triple H. Like, I don't know, Al Snow or somebody, you know? They, yeah, yeah, yeah. They they have someone from a, a, a developmental come up and, hey, yeah. you're going to be play a lawyer here. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. On behalf of Triple H, I'm filing this lawsuit against yeah. the Batista. The, the Davari guy, yeah. He comes over and says, I'm going to file a lawsuit against you. Oh, what? Oh, by the way, I don't want the world title. I want the Intercontinental Championship. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. what I want. Anyways, uh, so yeah, let us know what you guys think are some of AEW's biggest creative botches in the comments below. 
Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We appreciate it. Hey, do us a solid. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notify bell. We'd really appreciate it. Till next time, we'll see you around. Goodbye.